Preface to the Wrong of Slavery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wrong of Slavery, the Right of Emancipation and the Future of the African Race in the United States by Robert Dale Owen. Preface. It is a little more than three years since the first insurgent gun was fired against Fort Sumter. Three years, as we reckon time, a generation, if we calculate, by the stirring events and far-reaching upheavals that have been crowded into the eventful months. Things move fast in days like these. War changes the legal relations of the combatants. War in its progress presents unlooked-for aspects of affairs, brings upon us necessities, opens up obligations. The rebellion, creator and teacher as well as scourge and destroyer, confers new rights, discharges from old bonds, imposes bounden duties. Great questions come to the surface, questions of national policy, demanding solution. In deciding some of these, we find little aid from precedent, for our condition as a nation is, to a certain extent, unprecedented. We have been trying an experiment that never was tried in the world before. We have been trying to maintain a democratic government over 30 millions of people of whom 20 millions existed under one system, industrial and social, 10 millions under another. The 20 millions, chiefly of one race, carried out among themselves a declaration made 88 years ago touching the equal creation and the inalienable rights of man. The 10 millions consisted in nearly equal portions of two races, one the descendants of voluntary emigrants, who came hither seeking freedom and happiness in a foreign land the other deriving their blood from ancestors against whom was perpetrated a terrible wrong, who came in chains and were sold as chattels. From these forced emigrants and their descendants were taken away almost all human rights, the right of life and of perpetuating a race of bondsmen accepted. Laws denied to them the rights of property, of marriage, of family, of education, of self-defense. The master race sought to live by their labor. The experiment we have been trying for more than three-quarters of a century was whether over social and industrial elements thus discordant, a Republican government, asserting freedom in thought and speech and action, can be peacefully maintained. Grave doubts, gloomy apprehensions, touching the nation's future, have clouded the hopes of our wisest public men in days past. Even the statesmen of the Revolution saw on the horizon the cloud no bigger than a man's hand. Gradually it rose and spread and darkened. The tempest burst upon us at last. Then some, faint-hearted and despairing of the Republic, prophesied that the good old days were gone, never to return. Others, stronger in hope and faith, recognized through the gloom the correcting and reforming hand of God. They acknowledged that the experiment had failed, but they confessed also that it ought never to have seceded. In adversity men look into their hearts, there to read lessons which prosperity had failed to teach them. The experiment ought never to have seceded because it involved a grievous offense against humanity and civilization. In peace, before the act of slaveholders made them public enemies, we scrupled to look this offense in the face, seeing no remedy. But war, which has its mission, opened our eyes and released our hands. Times, disturbed and revolutionary, bring their good as well as their evil. In such times, abuses ripen rapidly. Their consequences mature. Their ultimate results become apparent. We are reminded of their transitory character. We are reminded that, although for the time and in a certain stage of human progress some abuses may have had their temporary use, and for this, under God's economy, may have been suffered to continue, yet all abuses have but a limited life. The right only is eternal. Great under such circumstances are our responsibilities. Momentous are the issues, for good or for evil, that hang upon our decisions. In this small volume, which busy men may read in a few hours, I have sought to bring together in condensed form the facts and the law which bear upon our present condition as a nation. My task has led me over a vast field, in briefly tracing from its inception in this hemisphere the rise and progress of the great wrong, which still threatens the real life of the nation, I have followed the fortunes of a vast multitude, equal in number to the population, loyal and disloyal, black and white, of these United States. I have sketched by the light of authentic documents 
the dismal history of that multitude through three centuries and a half seeking out their representatives and inquiring into the numbers and the condition of these at the present day in so doing i have arrived at conclusions which to those who have never looked closely into the subject may seem too marvellous for belief i invite a critical examination of my narrative and of the documents and statistics upon which rest its details and conclusions not doubting that the candid reader will become convinced of its substantial truth i have spared no pains to attain accuracy well knowing that thus only can i expect to bring home the great lesson which such an episode in human history is imminently fitted to teach passing then from the story of the wrong to look into its remedy i have touched upon that inquiry in its various legal and constitutional aspects as the connection of slavery with the constitution how far that instrument admits and how far it abstains from admitting the existence of such a system further the character of what is termed slave property the right of emancipation in the insurrectionary states the right of emancipation in the loyal slave states the jurisdiction of the supreme court in the premises the effect of the president's emancipation proclamation as well upon slaves within our lines as upon slaves still in the enemy's hands and the force of that proclamation both during war and after its conclusion in the same connection i have treated of emancipation as a great measure of national policy essential to the preservation inviolate of the constitution indispensable to the re-establishment of peace inseparable from the future maintenance north and south of domestic tranquillity in concluding this branch of the subject i have spoken of emancipation as a solemn national duty which now that the constitutional obstacle has been removed we cannot consistently with what we owe to god and man neglect or postpone i have shown that our faith is pledged and cannot be broken without bringing upon us the contempt of the civilized world finally after having traced the connection of the two races in the past and set forth the duty of one race towards the other in the present i have sought to look forward and inquire how they are likely when both shall be free to live together in the future whether we shall have a race among us unwilling or unable to support itself, whether admixture of the races, both being free, is probable or desirable, whether, without admixture, the reciprocal social influence of the races on each other promises good or evil, what are the chances that a base prejudice of race shall diminish and disappear, and lastly, whether, in case the colored man shall outlive that prejudice, disgraceful to us and depressing to him, and shall be clothed by law with the same rights in search of which we sought this western world there will be anything in connection with his future in these united states to excite regret or inspire apprehension if to the lovers of the union to the friends of peace to the adherents of lawful authority i shall have supplied an authentic form facts and arguments such as may be employed to arouse the listless to encourage the desponding and to strengthen our country's cause I shall ever be grateful for the opportunity that has been afforded me to bring these pages before the public. It is proper I should here state that in March 1863, a commission consisting of Colonel James McKay of New York, Dr. Samuel G. Howe of Boston, and myself, was appointed by the Secretary of War to examine and report upon the condition of the recently emancipated freedmen of the United States and that many of the materials for this volume are due to the joint investigations of that commission and were embodied in the final report prepared by myself as chairman of the commission in question i have to add my acknowledgments to the secretary of war for the permission kindly accorded to me to use and publish these in such form as i might judge proper to my colleagues i am indebted for valuable emendations and corrections to mr benjamin b hunt of philadelphia for the loan of part of his valuable library rich in works on west indian history and emancipation and to the secretary of the commission mr george t chapman for important aid in the task of collecting and collating the historical and statistical data upon which are based some of the most important deductions set forth in the pages which follow end of preface Introduction of The Wrong of Slavery, The Right of Emancipation, 
and the Future of the African Race in the United States by Robert Dale Owen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wrong of Slavery, the Right of Emancipation, and the Future of the African Race in the United States by Robert Dale Owen. Part 1. Introduction. Slavery. There is one calamity which penetrated furtively into the world, and which was at first scarcely distinguishable amidst the ordinary abuses of power. It originated with an individual whose name history has not preserved. It was wafted like some accursed germ upon a portion of the soil, but it afterwards nurtured itself, grew without effort, and spread naturally with the society to which it belonged. This calamity is slavery. Christianity suppressed slavery, but the Christians of the 16th century reestablished it, as an exception, indeed, to their social system, and restricted to one of the races of mankind. De Tocqueville End of Introduction Part 1 Chapter 1 of The Wrong of Slavery, The Right of Emancipation, and the Future of the African Race in the United States by Robert Dale Owen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wrong of Slavery, The Right of Emancipation, and the Future of the African Race in the United States by Robert Dale Owen Part 1 Chapter 1 As a Labor System The greatest social and political problems of the world connect themselves, more or less intimately, with the subject of labor. A people who regard work as degradation, though arts and letters flourish among them, are but emerging from barbarism. It has been sometimes said, with much truth, that the grade of civilization in a nation may be measured by the position which it accords to woman. A stricter test is the degree of estimation in which labor is held there. Our race, in its gradual advance from ignorance and evil to comparative knowledge and good, has not yet, even in countries the most favored, outlived an error fatal to true progress. Sometimes avowedly, more often practically, a certain stigma still attaches to human labor, to that labor from which, in one shape or another, the world receives everything of good, of useful, of beautiful, that charms the senses or ministers to the wants of man, to which we owe life and everything that makes life desirable. According to the structure of society in each country, this error is modified in form. In certain nations of continental Europe, the great line of social demarcation is drawn between the titled classes, whether noble by birth or ennobled by royal creation, constituting the privileged. And all other persons, including merchants, though wealthy, and lawyers, though eminent, and authors, though popular, constituting the unprivileged. More liberal England begins to admit within the pale the distinguished, and successful among the professional classes, and from the mercantile and literary ranks. We ourselves, professing to honor industry and talking occasionally of the nobility of labor, have opened somewhat wider, but only throughout a portion of our republic, the door which admits within the precincts of respectability. Only throughout a portion of our republic. In 15 of these United States, the opinions the feelings, the practice of the inhabitants as regards laborers and labor itself have been more perverted, have been less civilized than in the most despotic countries of Europe. In these states, the class of working husbandmen has been degraded, both as regards civil rights and social position, below the pariahs of India. This cannot happen in any nation without producing results fatal 
alike to its prosperity and to the moral worth and essential dignity of its population. The only doubt as to these results is whether their influence has been more pernicious on the enslavers or on the enslaved. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of the Wrong of Slavery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Borden. The Wrong of Slavery, the Right of Emancipation, and the Future of the African Race in the United States by Robert Dale Owen. Part One, Chapter Two: Enslavement of Indians. The introduction into our hemisphere of this terrible element of social demoralization was almost coeval with its discovery by Europeans. It was in October of the year 1492 that Columbus first landed, and it was just eight years afterward, in the month of October 1500, that Francis de Bovadilla was guilty of two outrages. One, the sending home in chains of the great discoverer, the other, the reducing to bondage of the gentle islanders whose fair land he discovered. Bovadilla, quote, granted liberal donations of Indians to all who applied for them. Footnote. Robertson's History of America, London, 1792, Volume 1, Book 2, page 222. Herrera, General History of the Vast Continent and Islands of America. Stevens Translation, London, 1725, Volume 1, page 244. The first year of the 16th century saw introduced into America that baneful system, abhorrent to Christian civilization, which was to spread and gather numbers and strength and influence until, after more than three centuries and a half of evil growth, it was to bring a million of combatants into the field, to sacrifice on the field of battle hundreds of thousands of lives and thousands of millions of treasure. There is scarcely a page in history so replete with horrors as that which records the inception of slavery in this hemisphere. That terrible abuse caused, and in an incredibly short period, the extinction of a race, a race whom all the historians of that day concur in representing as the most kind and inoffensive and hospitable of mankind. Gold must be had. Columbus had been disgraced because he had failed to send home a sufficiency of it. His successors resolved to escape that imputation. The mines must be worked, and the forced labor of the feeble natives was employed to work them. After a time, royal sanction was obtained for the act. Isabella, just if severe, who had issued orders that the Indians should be freed from servitude and from molestation, footnote, Ovando, quote, was particularly charged by the queen that all the Indians of Hispaniola should be free from servitude and that none should molest them, end quote. Herrera, volume 1, page 247 died in 1504, and in 1511 Ferdinand issued a decree of his privy council declaring that, quote, after mature consideration of the apostolic bull and other titles by which the crown of Castile claimed the right to its possessions in the new world, the servitude of the Indians was warranted both by the laws of God and man. Footnote, Robertson's History of America, Volume 1, page 307. This decree was passed against the protest of the Dominicans, the abolitionists of those days. Thus was legalized that system of repartimientos, under which there had been previously assigned to each Spaniard, by an order on some cacique, a certain number of natives who were to be instructed in the Catholic faith. What the character of their masters and teachers was may be gathered from the fact that Columbus himself, misled by his eagerness to people the continent he had discovered, had recommended the transportation to Hispaniola of malefactors convicted of the less atrocious capital crimes. Quote, the prisons of Spain, says Robertson, were drained to collect members for the intended colony. Footnote. Robertson, Volume 1, page 192-193. Herrera, Deck 1, Lib 3, C2. We are not left to imagine the fate of the helpless wretches confided to such hands. Irving tells us, they, the Indians, were separated the distance of several days' journey from their wives and children, and doomed to intolerable labor of all kinds extorted by the cruel infliction of the lash. Quote, when the Spaniards who superintended the mines were at their repasts, says Las Casas, the famished Indians scrambled like dogs for any bone thrown to them. If they fled from this incessant toil and barbarous coercion and took refuge in the mountains, they were hunted like wild beasts. 
scourged in the most inhumane manner and laden with chains to prevent a second escape. Close quote. Las Casas' terrible history is full of horrors, of which he himself was eyewitness. I have found, says he, many dead in the road, others gasping under the trees, and others again in the pangs of death, faintly crying, hunger, hunger. Footnote. Las Casas, History of the Indies, Lib. 2, Cap. 14, M.S., quoted by Irving. So intolerable, says Washington Irving, were the toils and suffering inflicted upon this weak and unoffending race, that they sank under them, dissolving, as it were, from the face of the earth. Footnote. Irving's Columbus, Volume 2, page 428. There is no exaggeration in this statement, incredible if it seem. Robertson confirms it, giving some general statistics on the subject. His words are, quote, The original inhabitants on whose labor the Spaniards and Hispaniola depended for their prosperity and even their existence wasted so fast that the extinction of the whole race seemed to be inevitable. When Columbus discovered Hispaniola, the number of its inhabitants was computed to be at least a million. They were reduced to 60,000 in 15 years. Footnote. Robertson's America, Volume 1, page 262. It is from Herrera, the most correct and intelligent of the Spanish historians of that period, that Robertson's calculation is taken. There seems no reason to discredit it. Other historians estimate the number of original inhabitants much higher. Benzoni puts it at two millions. This was 1507. Scarcely half a generation had elapsed since Europeans had found these people, weak and ignorant indeed, but simple, cheerful, and happy. And, in that brief period, so atrocious had been the cruelty of their treatment that 94 out of every hundred of the victims sank and perished under it. But the picture, in all its blackness, is not yet filled up. The deaths had increased with such frightful rapidity that the common operations of life were arrested thereby. The dead laborers had to be replaced by fresh victims. And then it was that, as the culmination of enormities that have left an indelible stain on the Spanish name, an expedient was resorted to, into the conception of which there entered not inhumane barbarity alone, but treachery and blasphemy also. This infamous expedient is ascribed to Ovando, at all events under his governorship in 1508. The king, Ferdinand, quote, was advised, says Herrera, that the Lucano Islands, footnote, now the Bahama Islands, being full of people, it would be convenient to carry them over to Hispaniola, that they might be instructed in the Christian religion and civilized, end quote. Ferdinand, perhaps deceived by this artifice, more probably willing to connive at an act of violence, which policy represented as necessary, gave his assent to the proposal. Herrera informs us in what manner it was carried into effect. Quote, the Spaniards who went in those first ships told those people that they came from Hispaniola, where the souls of their parents, kindred, and friends lived at their ease, and if they would go see them, they should be carried over in these ships. For it is certain that the Indian nations believed that the soul is immortal, and that, when the body was dead, it went to certain places of delight, where it wanted for nothing that might give it satisfaction. Footnote. Herrera, Volume 1, page 325. That simple people, says Robertson, listened with wonder and credulity, and, fond of visiting their relatives and friends in that happy region, followed the Spaniards with eagerness. By this artifice, over 40,000 were decoyed into Hispaniola to share in the sufferings which were the lot of the inhabitants of that island, and to mingle their groans and tears with that wretched race of men. Footnote, Robertson, History of America, Volume 1, page 263. By this expedient, the number of Indians in Hispaniola was raised to 100,000. But the work of human destruction went on. Nine years later, to wit, in 1517, Rodrigo Albuquerque, being appointed principal officer to distribute the repartimientos, caused an enumeration of the Indians to be made. The number was found to be reduced to 14,000. Six-sevenths had perished in nine years. The survivors were put up for sale in different lots. The secrets of their prison house what tongue can ever reveal. Such was the first advent in this hemisphere of that system under which human labor is stigmatized as a degradation. The mind cannot realize, the imagination shrinks from conceiving, the atrocious barbarities to which a system must have given birth, ere a race of men could have perished in a single generation before it. 
a terrible attestation to the immeasurable sufferings that may result from a single great crime. Well has de Tocqueville said, quote, There is one calamity which penetrated furtively into the world, and which was at first scarcely distinguishable amidst the ordinary abuses of power. It originated with an individual whose name history has not preserved. It was wafted like some accursed germ upon a portion of the soil, but it afterwards nurtured itself, grew without effort, and spread naturally with the society to which it belonged. This calamity is slavery. Christianity suppressed slavery, but the Christians of the 16th century re-established it, as an exception, indeed, to their social system, and restricted to one of the races of mankind. Footnote, Democracy in America, by de Tocqueville, Cambridge Edition, 1862, Volume 1, page 457. That another race was not subjected to it, that the Indians of Hispaniola and of the adjacent islands escaped perpetual servitude, is due not to the forbearance of their oppressors, but to the tender mercies of death, the great liberator. End of chapter 2. Recording by Matt Borden, plantdoc.org. Chapter 3 of The Wrong of Slavery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com The Wrong of Slavery, the Right of Emancipation, and the Future of the African Race in the United States by Robert Dale Owen Chapter 3 Substitution of the African for the Indian An incident to which is popularly ascribed to the first substitution of the African Negro from the native of Hispaniola the first introduction therefore among us of that race who were to be thenceforth for centuries branded with the mark of cain may teach us how humanity in her aberrations sometimes with the best intentions aids in lying broad the foundations of misery and of crime bartolomeo de la casas a dominican monk had accompanied columbus on his second voyage a man of eminent benevolence and quick sensibilities the sufferings of the downtrodden indians produced upon him a profound impression after spending many years in hispaniola in fruitless efforts to ameliorate the conditions of the natives he returned to spain previous to the death of ferdinand and was favorably received by that monarch and by his minister the cardinal zimenez and succeeded in procuring the appointment of three superintendents of the colonies to whom he himself was joined with the well-earned title of protector of the indians the mission however was of small avail the spaniards of hispaniola opposed every obstacle representing that without compulsion the indians would not labor and that without their labor the colony could not subsist finding no countenance in the island las casas again returned to spain where he arrived shortly before the death of Ximenes, and found Charles V, successor of Ferdinand. Then it was, after a vain endeavor to procure the freedom of the aborigines, that Las Casas, thinking that a hardier race than they would suffer less as slaves, recommended to Ximenes the policy of supplying the labor market of Hispaniola with negroes from the Portuguese settlements on the African coast. This, though affirmed by Robertson, followed by Herrera, is denied by several modern authors of repute. But the simple fact that Las Casas did make such a proposal, though not until after a certain number of African slaves had been imported into the New World, is beyond denial, seeing that it has been stated and notably atoned for, so far as frank acknowledgment of error can atone, by Las Casas himself, writing his own history shortly before his death in that retirement to which after years of fruitless exertion in behalf of the suffering natives he betook himself these literally translated are his words this advice that license be given to bring negro slaves to these lands the ecclesiastic casas first gave not taking note of the injustice with which the portuguese seize them and make them slaves which advice after he had reflected on the matter he would not have given for all he possessed in the world for he always held that they were made slaves unjustly 
and tyrannically seeing the same rule applies in their case as in that of the Indians. Ximenes, whether from motives of policy or humanity, rejected Las Casas' proposal, dying soon after. Las Casas renewed the proposal after Ximenes' death to the ministers of Charles, by whom it was more favorably received, and the officers of the India House of Seville, having recommended four thousand as the proper number to be sent, the young king acted upon the recommendation. In accordance with the monopoly-favoring policy of that age, Charles granted to one of his Flemish favorites a patent for the importation into the colonies of four thousand negro slaves. That patent was sold to a company of genios merchants, who about the year 1517 carried it into effect. This regards America was the germ of a traffic, the foulest blot on the history of Christendom, a traffic carried on, in defiance of law, human and divine, to exempt from labor one race of men at expense of brutal degradation to another, a traffic that has brought upon the American hemisphere a moral curse worse than war, pestilence, or famine, and which, as to every nation that persists in it, leads, ever must lead, sooner or later, by one way or another, to national ruin. End of chapter 3 Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio InterfaceAudio.com Part 1 Chapter 4 Of the Wrong of Slavery, the Right of Emancipation, and the Future of the African Race in the United States By Robert Dale Owen this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. The Wrong of Slavery, the Right of Emancipation, and the Future of the African Race in the United States by Robert Dale Owen. Part 1. Chapter 4. Number of Slaves Shipped from Africa. The statistical details are lacking which might enable us to form a strictly accurate numerical estimate of the victims of this detestable trade, the operations of which extended through three centuries and a half, diminishing, however, during the last quarter of a century, and soon, we may confidently hope, to cease forever. An approximating estimate of the number of Negroes transported to America is all that can now be obtained. The Asientos, Treaties, or contracts of the Spanish government for the supply of its American colonies with slaves, commencing in 1517, were occasionally granted throughout the 16th century and multiplied in the 17th and 18th. Some were to individuals, some to companies, some to governments. Nothing more strongly marks the character of these treaties for the delivery of human beings than the terms employed in wording them. An asiento was granted in 1696, to the Portuguese Guinea Company, by which that company bound itself to deliver to Spain, in her transatlantic colonies, 10,000 tons of Negroes. Footnote, Diez mil toneladas de Negroes, is the expression in the original. The text can be found in the Cantillo Collection, page 32. England, to designate the human chattels she agreed to supply, employed a term such as vendors of broadcloth or calico might use. By treaty with Spain, March 26, 1713, His Britannic Majesty undertook to introduce into Spanish America 114,000 pieces of India, of both sexes and all ages. Footnote, Piesas de Indias, are the words in the Spanish text. Abolition de Esclavage, Par Cochin, Tome 2, page 286. This treaty gave England a monopoly of the slave trade to Spanish colonies for 30 years, namely, from 1713 to 1744. These various treaties, concluded in the name of the Most Holy Trinity, footnote, El Nombre del Santisma Trinidad, contained not one article, not a single provision of any kind, for the humane treatment or for the protection from outrage, of the human merchandise therein stipulated to be delivered. Footnote, after enumerating the various asientos made by Spain, Cochin says, Dans tous ces traités, pas une disposition, pas une syllabe destinée à défendre ces malheureux contre les abus et les souffrances. Work cited, volume 2, page 288. 
The extent of these treaties, and their lucrative character to the Spanish crown, may be gathered from the following. A single government, Spain, which assumes the name of Catholic, concluded in less than two centuries more than ten treaties to authorize, protect, and profit by the transportation of more than half a million of human beings. It levied on each of these human heads, reckoning them by the piece or by the ton, a tax which amounted in the aggregate of upwards of fifty millions of francs, say, ten millions of dollars. Footnote, work cited, volume 2, page 288. The above treaties were with England, France, and Portugal, the grants to individuals and to companies not being included. In the middle of the 18th century the English slave trade, which up to that time had been more or less of a monopoly, was thrown open. Statute 23, George II, that is, in 1750, Chapter 31, after reciting that the African slave trade is very advantageous to Great Britain, enacts that it shall be lawful for all His Majesty's subjects to trade and traffic to and from any port or place in Africa between the Port of Sally, in South Barbary, and the Cape of Good Hope. Great Britain, the first to abolish this infamous traffic, was, previous to its abolition, the most extensively engaged in it. Her connection with it, the manner and extent to which it was conducted, together with many statistical details, imperfect indeed, but instructive as far as they go, are set forth in a ponderous folio volume, published by official authority in the year 1789, being a report of the Lords of the Committee of Council, appointed for the consideration of all matters relating to trade and foreign plantations, submitting to His Majesty's consideration, the evidence and information they have collected in consequence of His Majesty's order in Council, dated February 11, 1788, concerning the present state of the trade to Africa, and particularly the trade in slaves and concerning the effects and consequences of this trade, as well in Africa and the West Indies, as to the general commerce of this kingdom. There can be no safer document than this, from which to draw information such as it contains. The lords composing this committee of council gave the slaveholders ample opportunity to state their case, both by testimony and argument. Three-fourths, at least, of the witnesses examined are slave dealers or captains of slavers. They admit also, it is true, testimony and documentary evidence, especially as to deaths of sailors on slave ships, offered by the celebrated Thomas Clarkson. But they scrupulously abstain from all opinions in regard to the slave trade, and from all recommendations or suggestions touching on its abolition. In this volume we find two estimates as to the number of Negroes then, namely in 1788, annually carried to the American colonies. The first puts it at 80,000 annually. The second, containing a detailed estimate of slaves annually sold, at 16 different points on the African coast, sums up 74,000. Footnote. The first is contained in the testimony of Mr. Penny. Report, Part 1, Sheet 1. The second in that of Mr. Norris. Report, Part 1, Sheet K. The table in detail is given Part 4, Number 14. The volume not being paged, except as to a single brief document contained in it, to wit, minutes of evidence before a committee of the whole house, more exact references cannot be given. Of these, one half are said to be procured on the Gold Coast, at Bonny and New Calabar and at Loango, Malimba, and Cabenda. About 38,000 set down as purchased by the British, 20,000 by the French, 10,000 by the Portuguese and the rest by the Danes and Dutch. It would appear, from a statistical table given in another part of the same volume, that these estimates fall short of the truth. This table gives the total number of vessels sailing annually from Liverpool, from the year 1751 to the year 1787, distinguishing the slavers and giving their tonnage, from which it appears that about one-tenth of all the vessels that sailed from that port during the above thirty-six years were engaged in the slave trade, and that their tonnage ran up from a little over 5,000 tons in 1751 to about 15,000 in 1786 and 1787. Footnote. Lords of Council Report. Minutes of Evidence Before Committee of the Whole House. Page 49. But, as we shall show hereafter, the number of slaves carried average over two to a ton. 
Consequently, British ships from the port of Liverpool alone carried upwards of 30,000 annually. Another table, footnote, Lords of Council Report, Part 4, Number 1, shows that the tonnage of African slavers from all the ports of Great Britain was, in 1787, 22,263 tons. Consequently, the annual number of slaves transported to America, at that time, in British bottoms, was upward of 45,000, instead of 38,000 as estimated. In this proportion the total estimate, including vessels of all countries, would be run up to nearly 90,000 slaves a year. It would appear from other evidence that even this is below the actual number. The calculations produced before the French Committee of Inquiry of 1848 place the number of slaves exported from 1788 to 1840 at from 100,000 to 140,000 a year, and from 1840 to 1848 at from 50,000 to 80,000. Footnote. See Cochin, Volume 2, page 310. Lord Palmerston, from his place in the House of Lords, July 26, 1844, said, According to the report of Messrs. Vanderbilt and Buxton, from 120,000 to 150,000 slaves are landed annually in America. This calculation applied to the early years of the present century. The rate after 1848 continued to diminish. Nevertheless, in 1860 it was still nearly 30,000 a year. Footnote. When we remember that 140,000 were yearly carried away from Africa, while this year the number has not reached 30,000, we should neither deny the progress nor abandon the hope of a complete suppression of this traffic. Speech of Lord John Russell, in Parliament, June 8, 1860. At least 30,000 slaves are annually imported into Cuba. Speech of Mr. Cave, in Parliament, June 8, 1860. These figures enable us to calculate, with approximate accuracy, the extent of the slave trade from 1788 to 1860, that is to say, for the 72 last years of its course. Thus, annual deportation of slaves from the year 1788 to the year 1840, say 52 years, at an average of 120,000 a year, 6,240,000. Annual deportation from 1840 to 1848, say 8 years, at an average of 65,000 a year, 520,000. Annual deportation from 1848 to 1860, say 12 years, at an average of 30,000 a year, 360,000. Total in 72 years, 7,120,000. What annual rate we ought to assume, as a fair average for the two centuries preceding 1788, during which, as Cochin reminds us, all Europe abandoned itself openly to the Negro slave trade. Footnote. Au XVIIe et au XVIIIe siècle, l'Europe entière se livre ouvertement à la traite des Noirs. Cochin, l'abolition de l'esclavage. Tome 2, page 281. It is somewhat difficult to determine. In the report by the Lords of the Committee of Council, already referred to, is a table, footnote, Lords of Council Report, Jamaica, Appendix, Part 3, Sheet P showing the annual importation of slaves throughout 74 years of that period, namely, from 1702 to 1775, both inclusive, into a single English colony, to wit, the island of Jamaica. The total is 497,736, being an average of 6,726 a year. Nor is there a regular increase, for in the decade from 1720 to 1730, there were as many imported as in the last ten years of the term, the average for each of the years in either decade being about 7,700. But I shall hereafter furnish proof that to the number of slaves delivered in the colonies, we must add at least 25% to obtain the number shipped on the African coast. This would bring up the annual average exported from Africa to Jamaica to 8,407. If we assume the total deportation of slaves from Africa in the year 1788 to have been 100,000, which is the French Committee's lowest estimate for any year from 1788 to 1840, and if we suppose that there were annually exported, during each year of the two centuries preceding 1788, two-fifths only of that number, 
say 40,000, we shall be assuming the annual total throughout these two centuries at less than five times the number that we know to have been annually exported during 74 years of that period to supply the single island of Jamaica. So far as at this distance of time, and with the scanty materials before us, one can judge the estimate is a moderate one. Footnote, by a table already referred to, Part 4, Number 1. In the report of the Lords of Council, it appears that as early as 1701, 104 British vessels were employed in the slave trade. The number, however, varied very widely in different years, the lowest number in 1715 being but 24, and the highest in 1771 being 192. The table was obtained from the Inspector General of Imports and Exports. Previous to the year 1588, that is to say, for 80 years after the beginning of the Negro slave trade, probably about 1508, the true average is still more uncertain. The Spanish asientos of the 16th century were usually for the delivery of from 3,000 to 5,000 Negroes annually. Let us assume the entire slave trade by all nations during that period at 5,000 Negroes only for each year. Adopting the data above suggested, we obtain the following general results. Total deportation of Negroes by the slave trade from the year 1508 to the year 1860. From 1508 to 1588, 80 years, at an average of 5,000 a year, 400,000. From 1588 to 1788, 200 years, at an average of 40,000 a year, 8 million. From 1788 to 1860, 72 years, as already estimated, 7,120,000. Total in 352 years, 15,520,000. Upwards of 15 millions and a half of human beings, forcibly torn from their native country and doomed to perpetual slavery, themselves and their offspring, in a foreign land. Footnote. I have endeavored, in the above estimate, to avoid error, except it be on the side of moderation. Very reputable authorities put the importations in the 17th and 18th centuries considerably higher than I have assumed them. Bancroft, who appears to have carefully investigated the matter, says, The English slave trade began to attain its great activity after the Asiento Treaty. That treaty was dated March 26, 1713. From 1680 to 1700, the English took from Africa about 300,000 Negroes, or about 15,000 a year. The number, during the continuance of the Asiento, may be averaged not far from 30,000. It continued for 30 years, to wit, from 1713 to 1744. Raynal considers the number of Negroes exported by all European nations from Africa before 1776 to have been 9 millions, and the considerate German historian of the slave trade, Albert Hune, deems his statement too small. A careful analysis of the colored population of America at different periods, and the inference to be deduced from the few authentic records of the numbers imported, corrected by a comparison with the authentic products of slave labor, as appearing in the annals of English commerce, seem to prove, beyond a doubt, that even the estimate of Raynal is larger than the reality. Bancroft's History of the United States, Volume 3, page 412. Raynal's estimate, thought too low by Hune, is 9 millions up to 1776. And, as the exportations averaged about 80,000 a year from 1776 to 1778, that would give a million more, bringing his calculation up to 10 millions if extended to 1788. But my estimate, as above, up to that year, is but 8 millions 400,000, that is, upwards of a million and a half, or just 16% below Reynolds. Bancroft thinks that we shall not err much if in the century previous to 1776 we assume the number imported by the English to have been 3 millions. But I have assumed the total imported by all nations in the two centuries preceding 1788 to have been 8 millions. Bancroft estimates importation in a single century by one nation only at 3 millions. I estimate importation in two centuries by all nations at 8 millions. The probability will be conceded that the former estimate is at a higher rate in proportion than the latter.
End of Part 1 Chapter 4part one chapter five of the wrong of slavery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the wrong of slavery the right of emancipation and the future of the african race in the united states by robert dale owen how slaves were obtained in africa but we cannot attain to a just conception of the aggregate of evil and suffering produced by this gigantic outrage upon human rights nor the loss of life attendant thereon without considering first the mode in which slaves were supplied to the european traders secondly the manner in which they were transported to their destination and thirdly the result especially in its influence on population in the slave colonies as to the two first subjects the report of the lords of council unimpeachable testimony furnishes many suggestive particulars it is proved in the first place that the sources whence slaves were obtained on the african coast were first as prisoners of war the evidence as to this source of supply was obtained from almost all the witnesses who had visited the african coast major general rook said when a ship arrived to purchase slaves the king of Damo sent to the chiefs of the villages in his dominions to send them a given number but if they were not to be procured on this requisition the king went to war till he got as many as he wanted during his stay at gore of four or five months he heard of two battles being fought for slaves captain t wilson employed on the business of government in seventeen eighty three and seventeen eighty four states as to the kingdom of Demel when they were at war they made prisoners and sold them and when they were not at war they made no scruple of taking any of their own subjects and selling them even whole villages at once he has been told that the king of demel can bring seventy thousand or eighty thousand men into the field captain hills there was scarcely an evening in which we did not see people go out in war dresses to obtain slaves from the neighboring villages this was at gore the manner in which sir george young understood that slaves became so is first as prisoners of war and these he thinks are the greatest number this was in senegal and gambia but the same account was given to him all along the coast the rev mr newton the greater number of slaves are captives made in war mr dalrymple says one of the modes of making slaves adopted by the kings and great men is by breaking up a village that is setting fire to it and seizing the people as they escape this occurs sometimes in a neighbor's territory more frequently in their own the practice is notorious the witness speaks of gambia and countries adjoining another mode of procuring slaves is akin to this they are panjared to employ the phrase of the country that is kidnapped by individuals dr a sparman inspector of the royal museum at stockholm and a traveller in the interior of africa deposed they seize one another in the night when they have an opportunity and sometimes invite each other to their houses and there detain and sell them to the european traders the number of persons so kidnapped is considerable he himself witnessed two instances mr falconbridge surgeon of slaver testifies on the windward coast the negroes are afraid of stirring out at night lest they be kidnapped a woman big with child told him she was caught as she was returning from a neighbor's house mr devoin says speaking of the gold coast the greater part of the slaves are brought from the interior they are sold from hand to hand and many of them come a great distance it is said from eight hundred to nine hundred miles the next source of supply is the selling of criminals the universal testimony is that the chief crimes for which they are sold are adultery theft and witchcraft sometimes for murder occasionally they are sold for debt some stake their liberty in gambling and are sold if they lose admiral edwards said adultery is the crime for which they are most usually sold in this case the person offended has a claim not only to the man and woman offending and to all their property but also to their family and slaves theft is common among them one witness mr dazel testifies that he purchased a son of his father who sold him to avoid the punishment which the son had incurred for stealing from a white man which the witness adds 
is never pardoned. This was in the kingdom of Dahomey. A witness, Mr. Weaver, explained that they understand by witchcraft the power of doing mischief by supernatural means. Another witness, Mr. Matthews, testifies that having refused to purchase a man suspected of witchcraft, who was offered to him for sale, they tied a stone around his neck and threw him into the sea. The Reverend Mr. Baggs, chaplain of Commodore Thompson, during two voyages in 1783 and 1784, says of the African coast generally, the revenue of the kings of the country depends on the sale of slaves. They therefore strain every nerve to accuse and condemn. Their codes of law are made subservient to the slave trade. Mr. Penny deposes, some are made slaves in consequence of gaming, of which they are very fond. They stake themselves, first a leg, then an arm, lastly the head, and when they have lost that, they surrender themselves as slaves. If a man stake and lose a leg only, he continues gambling until he has lost the whole of himself, or is cleared. There is no evidence that slaves were bred for sale, but concurrent testimony is against it. There is abundant testimony and proof that as to Negroes offered for sale as slaves and rejected by the slave dealers on account of their state of health or otherwise, their fate is usually a sad one. Even delay in the market may cause their death. The Reverend Mr. Baggs said, He had proof that when marauding parties came with their booty and slaves to the coast and find no vessel, they killed the slaves because of the expense of sending them back. Mr. Falconbridge said, He has seen slaves who were offered for sale and refused, cruelly beaten. Mr. Penny, who has made eleven voyages as captain of slavers, deposes, he has been repeatedly informed that slaves bought for sale and rejected by the slave dealers on account of disease or otherwise are destroyed as not worth their food. Sir George Young saw a beautiful child about five years old, brought from the Bulham shore opposite Sierra Leone. As the child was too young to be an object of trade, the persons who had him to sell gave him no food and threatened to throw him into the water. Sir George, to save his life, offered a quarter cask of Madeira for him, which was accepted, brought him to England, and made a present of him to the Marquis of Lansdowne. He understood this child had been kidnapped. Mr. Arnold, surgeon on board a slaver, testified, one day a woman with a child in her arms was brought to us to be sold. The captain refused to purchase her, not wishing to be plagued with the child on board, so she was taken back to shore. On the following morning she was again brought to us, but without the child, and apparently in great sorrow. The black trader admitted that the child had been killed in the night to accommodate the sale. What a lifting of the veil upon a terrible series of atrocities is there, even in these brief extracts, coldly and dispassionately worded as they are. For what a catalogue of crimes were they responsible who sent slavers to the African coast? What wars have they not stirred up? What murders instigated? What temptations have they not presented to the cupidity of savage sovereign and subject alike? If the king of Dahomey or some other royal barbarian perverted criminal law to obtain convictions as a source of revenue, if a black trader put to death the infant that the mother might be salable, who were the tempters to such acts? Who were the original authors of this wickedness? The horrors of the Middle Passage were surpassed by those that necessarily preceded it. The ministers of the British Crown cannot be accused of sentimentalism. They are no declaimers, no propagandists, no extremists in speculative philanthropy. Their humanity is tempered with moderation and suggested by official evidence. Yet with what perseverance have they labored, even to the present day, after themselves abolishing the slave trade in 1807? to procure its subsequent abolition by all civilized nations, within twenty-five years, to wit, between 1818 and 1842, they concluded twenty-three treaties on the subject, with Holland, Sweden, Denmark, Russia, Austria, Prussia, Naples, Tuscany, Sardinia, the Hans Towns, the United States, Haiti, Texas, Mexico, Colombia, New Granada, Venezuela, Ecuador, Uruguay, Buenos Aires, Chile, Peru, and Bolivia. Lord Palmerston, speaking in the House of Lords in 1844, gave some of the reasons which stirred the government to move in this matter. He said, 
the negroes destined for the slave trade are not taken from the neighborhood where they are embarked a great number come from the interior many are captives made in wars excited by thirst for the gain procured by the sale of the prisoners but the greatest number arise from kidnapping expeditions and an organized system of man-stealing in the interior of africa when the time approaches to set out with the slave caravans for the coast the kidnappers surround a peaceful village at night set it on fire and seize on the inhabitants killing all who resist the village attacked is situated on a mountain offering facilities for flight and the inhabitants take refuge in the caverns the kidnappers kindle large fires at the entrance and those who are sheltered there placed between death by suffocation and slavery are forced to give themselves up if the fugitives take refuge on the heights the assailants render themselves masters of all the springs and wells and the unfortunates devoured by thirst return to barter liberty for life the prisoners made they proceed to the choice the robust individuals of both sexes and the children of above six or seven years of age are set aside to form part of the caravan which is to be driven to the seashore they rid themselves of the children under six years by killing them on the spot and abandon the aged and infirm thus condemning them to die of hunger the caravan sets out men women and children traverse the burning sands and rocky defiles of the, the mountains of africa barefoot and almost naked the feeble are stimulated by the whip the strong are secured by chaining them together or placing them under a yoke many fall from exhaustion on the road and die or become the prey of wild beasts on reaching the seashore they are penned up and crowded together in buildings called baracoons where they fall a prey to epidemics death often cruelly thins their ranks before the arrival of a slave traitor lord palmerston's general deduction from these and other facts connected with the trade is contained in the same speech it is calculated he says that of three negroes seized in the interior of africa to be sent into slavery but one reaches his destination the two others die in the course of the operations of the slave trade whatever may be the number yearly landed therefore we must triple it to obtain the true number of human beings which this detestable traffic annually carries off from africa a portion of the facts which form the data of such calculation remain to be considered the manner namely of stowing and of treating negroes in slave ships and the mortality thence resulting end of part one chapter five chapter six of the wrong of slavery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the wrong of slavery the Right of Emancipation, and the Future of the African Race in the United States by Robert Dale Owen How Slaves Were Transported from Africa The report of the Lords in Council, from which I have already so copiously quoted, furnishes exact and conclusive evidence as to the space commonly allowed to slaves during their passage. The vessels employed were usually from 100 to 250 or 300 tons burden averaging in early times little over 100 tons, but towards the end of the 18th century being of the capacity of 150 or 200 tons. The universal testimony is that the average number carried per ton was two persons and upwards. John Anderson, master of slaver, conceives that two slaves to a ton cannot crowd a ship. Sir George Young of the British Navy says, the usual allowance of space is two slaves to a ton, sometimes three, if two were allowed to a ton, he thought there would be room enough. A bill had been introduced into Parliament which proposed to limit the number for each ton. Evidence was taken as to its effect, resulting as follows. James Penny had made 11 voyages as captain of slaver. He was asked, if the blank of the bill is filled with one and a half to a ton, will it, in your opinion, tend to the abolition of the trade? Answer, I am clearly of opinion that it will. Footnote. Lords of Council's Report, Minutes of Evidence, page 41, end of footnote. This witness handed in a table, of which the accuracy was afterwards endorsed by Mr. Tarleton, a Liverpool merchant extensively engaged in the slave trade, exhibiting the estimate of profit or loss on a vessel of 100 tons at different rates of slaves per ton. Here it is. 
At one man per ton, the loss is 590 pounds, one shilling. At one man and a half per ton, the loss is 206 pounds, 19 shillings, nine pence. At two men per ton, the profit is 180 pounds, three shillings, and six pence. At two men and a half per ton, the profit is 761 pounds, five shillings, six pence. Footnote from Lord of Council's Report, Minutes of Evidence, page 21. End of footnote. James Jones, six years captain of a slaver, deposed, if a ship of 200 tons does not purchase 400 slaves or more, she must certainly sink the owner's money. He was asked, what measurement do the merchants allow for each slave? Answer, in a ship of 200 tons and under, merchants all carry more than two slaves to each ton. Being asked what width was allowed at that rate to each slave when stowed below, he answered, a full-grown slave takes 16 inches in width, smaller slaves 12 to 14 inches. Footnote, report cited minutes of evidence, pages 44 and 45. End of footnote. John Matthews, 17 years in the slave trade, was asked, what space in length and breadth do you consider sufficient for the health and comfort of the Negroes on board? Answer, the space they occupy when they lie on their backs is always considered sufficient for them. When asked for the number of inches, he at first refused to give it, saying he did not know. Afterwards, he gave 14 and two-third inches as a fair average. Footnote, report cited minutes of evidence, pages 24 and 25. End of footnote. Another slave captain, James Bowen, expressed a different opinion. He said the average number of slaves carried is two to a ton. Is of opinion that the greatest number of slaves which a ship can carry consistent with the preservation is not above one per ton. Footnote, Lords of Council Report, Part 3, Sheet D. End of footnote. James Penny, a part of whose evidence has already been quoted, said, The average allowance of width to a slave is 14 inches and two-thirds. Captain Perry was sent to Liverpool by government in 1788 to take the dimensions of ships employed in the African trade. A plan and sections are given of one of these, the Brooks, a ship of 297 tons burden, well known in the trade. The room said by her owners to be allowed for each slave was, for men, each, 6 feet by 16 inches, for women, each, 5 feet 10 inches by 16 inches, for boys, each, 5 feet by 14 inches, for girls, each, 4 feet 6 inches by 12 inches. At these rates, Captain Perry found that she could carry 470 slaves. But she did carry 607, being about 2 to a ton. This reduces the width actually allowed to the men to less than 12 inches and a half, and the rest in proportion. Footnote. Mr. William James, who had made three voyages on slavers, testified that on board the Britannia, the height between decks was about 5 feet and a half. No slave whatever had room to turn himself when the cargo was completed. The chief mate, Bozen, and an active young man were employed in stowing or packing them together, as in adjusting their arms and legs and prescribing a fixed space for each. Lord's Report, Part 2, Sheet D, 7, End of Footnote. What terrible glimpses of human suffering are furnished by these dry, mathematical details. The slaver, to make money, must stow his human cargo with 12 to 16 inches only of board for each to lie on. Lord Palmerston, speaking of African slave ships, strikingly says, a Negro has not as much room in them as a corpse in a coffin. Footnote. Speech, already quoted, of July 26, 1844. End of footnote. As the witnesses examined by the Lords in Council were, for the most part, masters or surgeons of slavers, or merchants engaged in the trade, the results of this frightful system only occasionally come to light. The slaves, thus stowed away like so much inanimate cargo, often felt their lives so grievous a burden that they attempted suicide sometimes by throwing themselves overboard, sometimes by refusing all food. To prevent the first mode of self-destruction, as well as to avoid the dangers of insurrection, the men's slaves were always put in irons, fastened two and two, the chains being locked at different intervals to the deck. Footnote. Testimony of John Newton, made of slaver. Lord's Report, Part 2, Sheet B, 2. End of footnote and when released and brought on deck as they were every fine day, were compelled, by fear of the lash, to exercise, to dance, as the phrase of the trade was, in their fetters. Footnote. While the slaves are upon deck, it is thought necessary that they should take exercise, for which purpose the chief mate and bosom are stationed with a cat and nine tails, to compel them to dance, as it is called. Testimony of William Jones, Lord's Report, Part 2, Sheet D, 7. End of footnote. As to the second mode of suicide, by self-inflicted starvation, its frequency rendered it an object of suspicion and of punishment. Captain Hall, a slave trader, deposes, 
has known instances of slaves being punished for not eating, supposed to be from stubbornness when in reality it was from indisposition. And in some instances, the slaves so punished have been found dead next morning. Footnote. Lord's Report, Part 2, Sheet C, 2. End of footnote. The women and children were not chained and had usually more liberty than the men. But a surgeon of a slaver, Mr. James Arnold, thus indicates the spirit in which they were sometimes treated. When the women were sitting by themselves below, he had heard them singing, but always at these times in tears. Their songs contained the history of their separation from friends and country. These songs were so disagreeable to the captain that he has taken them up and flogged them in so terrible a manner for no other reason than this, that he, Mr. Arnold, has been a fortnight or three weeks in healing the incisions made. Footnote, Lord's Report, Part 2, Sheet D2. End of footnote. In severe weather, when the slaves could not be brought on deck, the mortality was often frightful. An instance is stated of a schooner which carried only 140 slaves, meeting with a gale of wind which lasted 18 hours and losing in that brief space of time 50 slaves, upwards of one-third of the whole number. But worse misfortunes than storms sometimes overtook these poor wretches. Mr. William James testifies as follows. In the year 1779, being master of the hound, sloop of war and coming from the Bay of Honduras to Jamaica, he fell in off the Isle of Pines with two Liverpool guinea men on the middle passage, commanded by Captains Ringmaiden and Jackson, who had very imprudently, but whether willfully or not he cannot say, missed the island of Jamaica. Captain Nugent gave them chase and came up with them. Mr. James, upon boarding them, found them in great distress, both on account of provisions and water. He asked the captains, for both of them were on board one ship, why they did not go into the watering place at the west end of the Isle of Pines, near Cuba. They replied that they had attempted to get in, but got into shoal water. He then asked them what they intended to have done with their slaves if they had not fallen in with the hound. They replied, to make them walk the plank, that is, to jump overboard. Mr. James asked them again, why they did not turn a number of the slaves on shore at the Isle of Pines and endeavor to save the rest. They replied again that in such case they could not have recovered the insurance and that the rest would have gotten on shore. Footnote. Large Report, Part 2, Sheet D, 7. End of footnote. The supply of water usually taken appears to have been very scanty. The same witness, speaking of his experience on board the Britannia, says, Their rooms were so hot and intolerable that they were continually calling out for water and they generally came upon deck in a sweat. They were served twice a day with water, which is given them in a pannikin of tin, of such dimensions as to hold not quite half a pint. Footnote. Report cited. Part 2. Sheet D. 7. End of footnote. Dysentery and diseases of a similar character were common among them. The details, as furnished by eyewitnesses who have given their experience, are too loathsome for reproduction. Mr. Falconbridge, a surgeon in this trade who published a work on this subject in 1789 after giving a minute description of the scene below, adds, The deck or floor of their rooms resembled a slaughterhouse. It is not in the power of the human imagination to picture to itself a situation more dreadful or disgusting. Numbers of the slaves fainted and were carried on deck where some of them died and the others were with difficulty restored. It had nearly proved fatal to me also. Footnote, Falconbridge's account of the slave trade, page 31, and a footnote. That under such a system, the average mortality should be very great can surprise no one. What the true average was is somewhat difficult to determine. That it was chiefly caused by the plan of packing human beings, sometimes for days and nights together, in a width of from 12 to 16 inches each is certain. The Reverend John Newton, who in early life had gone out as mate in a slaver, after stating that on his first voyage they buried one-third of the number taken, added that on a subsequent voyage they did not lose one, the only instance of the kind that was ever known, he admits. Being cross-questioned as to the probable cause of this exceptional result, he said it was to be ascribed to the fact that, with room for 220 slaves, the number for which his cargo was calculated, they carried 90 only. The mortality was least from the windward coast, greatest from Bonnie, Calabar, Benin, and Gaboon. Individual instances were frequently adduced by the witnesses in which it was about 5%. Occasionally, a witness alleges that to be the average, but this was in the windward trade. From the other points named, they usually admit an average of 10%. Mr. James Penny, 11 years a slave captain, speaking of the trade, generally said, on an average, he estimated, from his own experience and the best information he could collect, that the mortality was one-twelfth. 
The only official table on this subject given in the Lord's report indicates a much higher rate of mortality than that admitted by these slave traders. This table is taken from the books of the Board of Trade. It exhibits the number of Negroes shipped and the number delivered throughout nine years, namely from 1680 to 1688, both inclusive by the African Company, and it's from a statement made by the company itself. It is as follows. Table. In 1860, there were 5,190 Negroes shipped, 3,751 Negroes delivered for a yearly loss of 27 and two-thirds percent. In 1681, there were 6,327 Negroes shipped, 4,989 Negroes delivered for a yearly loss of 21 and one-seventh percent. In 1682, there were 6,330 Negroes shipped, 4,494 Negroes delivered for a yearly loss of 29%. In 1683, there were 9,081 Negroes shipped, 6,488 Negroes delivered for a yearly loss of 28 and one half percent. In 1684, there were 5,384 Negroes shipped, 3,845 Negroes delivered for a yearly loss of 28 and one half percent. In 1685, there were 8,658 Negroes shipped, 6,304 Negroes delivered for a yearly loss of 29 and three quarters percent. In 1686, there were 8,355 Negroes shipped, 6,812 Negroes delivered for a yearly loss of 18 and two-fifths percent. In 1687, there were 5,606 Negroes shipped, 4,777 Negroes delivered for a yearly loss of 14 and four-fifths percent. In 1688, there were 5,852 Negroes shipped, 4,936 Negroes delivered for a yearly loss of 15 and two-thirds percent. In total, there were 60,783 Negroes shipped, 46,394 Negroes delivered for an average loss of 23 and two-thirds percent. The mortality, it will be observed, was 14,389 out of 60,783 shipped. That is 23 and two-thirds percent. Footnote, it is worthy of regard in connection with this excessive mortality that it occurred among persons all taken in the very prime of life. End of footnote. The results from an official table like this, presenting an average on so large a scale, are far more reliable than any deductions from isolated cases or individual testimony or opinion. The very witnesses who spoke of 5% as the usual loss, when pressed in cross-questioning, admitted far heavier losses to be of frequent occurrence, as John Newton, Archibald Dalzell, Thomas Eldridge. This last admitted that on a single voyage, he lost half his slaves and half his crew. The great crime avenged itself on those who aided in its perpetration. The epidemics which prevailed among the slaves were often communicated to the sailors, exposed as they were on deck day and night, and daily employed in occupations the most infectious and revolting, cleansing the lower decks and the like. Sir George Young says, a guinea ship seldom returns with more than half her complement of sailors and he believes the annual loss of seamen in that trade is equal to the manning of two ships of the line. The celebrated Thomas Clarkson supplied to the Lord's Committee evidence on this point. He submitted a table exhibiting the results as to 88 slavers that returned to Liverpool in the years 1786 and 1787. It showed that out of 3,170 sailors shipped, there came home but 1,428, less than one half. 642, about 20%, are recorded as having died. The rest had deserted or were left behind on account of sickness. Of those who returned, many went to the hospital and never recovered their health. Another table shows the deaths of seamen on 24 West India men in a single voyage to have been six, while in 24 slavers it was 216. The average number of seamen employed on slavers being 36 on each, as 3,170 on 88 vessels in the table just referred to, the above is a mortality of 216 out of 864, or just 25 percent. Mr. Clarkson shows by other tables that the loss of semen on board slavers is 20 times as great 
in proportion to numbers is on board vessels in the Petersburg or Newfoundland or Greenland trade. And he adds an expression of his belief that the annual loss of seamen in the English slave traders is greater than that in all other English trading vessels put together. Footnote. Lords of Council Report, Part 2, Sheet F3. End of footnote. So odious did this service become that seamen could usually be obtained for it only by fraudulent means, through crimson landlords of sailors' boarding houses, though two months' wages, instead of the usual month's pay, were offered in advance. Upon the whole, it seems to be sufficiently established that the usual rate of mortality among seamen was not less than 25% for each voyage, that is, during one year for the rule of the African slave trade was one round voyage each year. As to the mortality among the slaves, there seems no good reason why we should not adopt the rate of loss shown in the statement of the African company, as the average on 60,000 slaves shipped in their vessels, namely 23 and two-thirds percent. But even to this terrible mortality, a material item may have to be added. Among the documents in the Lord's Report is a report presented December 12, 1788, by a committee of the Jamaica House of Assembly to that house. This committee, desiring to avert the inferences as to ill treatment of slaves, liable to be drawn from the great decrease of the slave population of the island, made inquiry as to the number of new Negroes that have perished in the harbors of the island between the time of their being reported at the Custom House and the day of sale, all of which are reported in official books and returns as Negroes actually imported. They found, from the examination of a Negro factor, Mr. Lindo, that out of 7,873 Negroes consigned to him in the years 1786, 1787, and 1788, and reported at the Custom House, 363 died in the harbor of Kingston before the day of sale. Footnote, Lords of Council's Report, Part 3, Sheet R. End of footnote. This gives a mortality of about four and two-thirds percent on shipboard after entry and before landing. It does not clearly appear from the table of the African company whether by Negroes delivered, they mean those entered as arrived in the books of the office, or those actually offered for sale. If the former, then we have four and two-thirds percent to add to twenty-three and two-thirds percent, furnished in the African country's table, making an aggregate of twenty-eight and one-third percent as the average mortality incident to the passage. What shall we say of the estimates of those slave dealers who would have us believe that the entire average mortality among slaves on the terrible middle passage amounted to about one-fifth of the mortality among the crews of slavers, and only to about the percentage which, by official documents, we find to have taken place after the close of the voyage, during a few days' delay in harbor previous to disembarkation? On the whole, whether this loss in harbor is to be added to the African company's estimate or not, it may be confidently assumed that the mortality among slaves imported from the eastern to the western hemisphere estimated from the time of shipping to that of landing, did not fall short of from 20 to 25 percent. Lest we exaggerate, however, let us put it at 20 percent only. Footnote. It may not be wholly unnecessary to remind the reader, if he be not familiar with the calculation of percentages, that if 20 percent of the Negroes received on board be the number lost on the middle passage, while we must deduct that percentage from the total ship to ascertain the number landed in the colonies, we must add not 20, but 25 percent to the number landed if we wish to obtain the number shipped. Thus, if the number of Negro ships be 100, we obtain the number landed, namely 80, by deducting 20 percent from 100. But to these 80, we must add 25 percent on 80 in order to obtain the original number shipped, namely 100. The term middle passage is not to be understood as designated from the transoceanic route to the West Indies from any particular portion of the slave coast. Middle passage or mid-passage, the passage of a slave ship from Africa across the Atlantic Ocean, Wooster's Dictionary. End of footnote. It is considered a bloody battle when 10% of the combatants engaged are killed or wounded. The loss at Gettysburg did not amount to so high a percentage. Nor, even when that proportion of killed and wounded is reached, does the ultimate mortality amount to 5%. Through what a frightful ordeal, then, were those poor wretches during their incarceration of 8 or 10 weeks on board Christian-owned slavers? doomed to pass. Their ranks, twice decimated in that brief period, their numbers without regard to age or sex, thin by death as the number of soldiers passing through four sanguinary battles seldom are, not inspired as the soldier may be by zeal in a cause, not sustained as the soldier in battle is by hope of victory, their future dark, purposeless despairing as the prospect of pitiless slavery ending only at death could make it. What people, even under the harrow of pagan victory, were ever made to endure what they endured? And this crime of one portion of God's creatures against another portion was committed 
not in the case of thousands, nor even of millions only. It was committed through the persistent barbarities of three centuries and a half, in the case of tens of millions. When we consider the character of the means employed in Africa to fill up the slave cargoes, the wasting wars waged to procure prisoners, the marauding bands of kidnappers firing villages and killing all who resisted, the slaughter of those who were too young, and the abandonment of those who were too old or infirm to be marketable, the deaths on the long desert journey, and again in the pestilence invaded barracoons, and yet again in the dungeons of the slave ship. When we reflect upon all these prolific sources of mortality, we shall not be inclined to consider Lord Palmerston guilty of exaggeration when he calculated that we must treble the number of slaves actually landed in the colonies to find the total of persons who were consigned to death or slavery by the various operations of the trade, from its inception in the old world to its close in the harbors of the new. But lest in this the British Premier should have exaggerated, let us assume that the number of those who perished in Africa by slave wars, marauding murders, pestilence, and the extremity of hardship previous to embarkation was but equal to the number embarked. In other words, let us to obtain the entire number of victims, lower the estimate to double the number only that were actually received on board slave ships. Then, according to our previous calculation, assuming the number shipped from Africa in the three and a half centuries through which this traffic lasted to have been 15 millions and a half, we have 31 millions as the total number of Negroes who have been consigned to death or to foreign slavery, that one race of men might live by the labor of another. 31 millions, a portion of mankind equal in number to the entire inhabitants, northern and southern, white and colored, of the United States. Of these 31 millions, upwards of 3 millions, a population equal to that of the United States when independence was declared, were cast into the Atlantic. Footnote. The dead were thrown overboard even in port. Captain Cook, commanding a trade vessel on the east coast of Africa in 1836, 1837, and 1838, informed Mr. Fowl Buxton that slaves who die on board in ports are never interred on shore but are invariably thrown overboard when they sometimes float backwards and forwards with the tide for a week should the sharks and alligators not devour them. The African Slave Trade by Thomas Fowle Buxton, London, 1839, page 93. End of footnote. While less than 10 millions and a half were landed in colonial ports and distributed to planters from the auction block. Footnote. C. For confirmation of the moderation of these estimates, Appendix Note A. End of footnote. Never in any three centuries of man's written history was the violation of a great principle alike in political economy, in national morals, and in the religion of Christ, followed by a succession of outrages against God's creatures. In numbers, a vast nation, so openly sanctioned by public law and solemn treaty, so shamelessly countenanced by public opinion, yet so marked at every stage of its progress by those flagrant enormities which usually arouse loud-spoken indignation even when they do not stir to practical reform among mankind. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Wrong of Slavery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Wrong of Slavery, the Right of Emancipation, and the Future of the African Race in the United States by Robert Dale Owen. Chapter 7 What Became of the Imported Slaves? We have raised the curtain on but the first two acts of the great tragedy, the scene being laid of the first in Africa, of the second in the prison slaver. The third and last opening on colonial plantations remains to be glanced at. We must say a few words as to the treatment of those who survived death to become, in foreign land, slaves, and the progenitors of slaves. The graphic recital of individual barbarities, authentic examples of which can be found without number, are best calculated to stir indignation. But a doubt may obtrude itself in reading these, 
as to how far they constitute the rule and how far they are to be taken as the exception only. Statistical details on a large scale, grave and dispassionate though their language be, addressed not to the heart, but to the reason, carry with them a force of evidence far beyond that of individual example, a force of evidence against which sophistry strives in vain, which compels conviction, except when the mind is closed against all proof by the hermetic influence of prejudice. I select an example of such evidence, based on official tables running through nearly three-quarters of a century, and bearing upon the character of slavery in the principal English colony in the West Indies. The character of England for humanity, as compared with that of other owners of slave colonies, Spain, France, Holland, is not below the average, and on that score the example may be assumed as fair. To the Jamaica House of Assembly, convened by the governor of the colony, August 6, 1702, a return was made of the Negroes and stock then on the island. The number of slaves was 41,596. In the report of the Lords and Council, from which I have already so copiously extracted, is a table giving the number of Negroes annually imported into and exported from the island of Jamaica, from the year 1702 to the year 1775, both inclusive, that is, during 74 years. There were imported 497,736. There were exported 137,014. Leaving an addition by the importation to the Negro population of the island in 74 years of 360,722. These two items of 41,596 Negroes in the island in 1702 and of 360,722 imported from Africa from that time up to 1775, together 402,318, give the number of Negroes who would have been in the island in 1775, if the population had neither augmented by natural increase nor diminished by mortality in the previous 74 years. But in point of fact, this population of 402,318 was represented in 1775 by only 192,787 survivors. It had diminished in three quarters of a century by 209,531, that is, to less than one half. A similar table to that above referred to for Jamaica is given for the British West Indian colony, next in importance, namely the island of Barbados. It extends, however, over 17 years, only, namely, from 1764 to 1780, both inclusive. It indicates a rate of decrease in the slave population, far greater than even that in Jamaica. It appears from the table that in 1764, there were in the island 70,706 Negroes that were imported in the next 17 years, namely, up to 1780, 38,843. No importations of Negroes in the last seven years of the period, nor any exportations of them throughout the period being recorded. To 70,706, the number in 1764 add 38,843, the number imported in 17 years, and we have 109,549 as the number of Negroes who, if there had been no natural increase or decrease of population, would have been alive in 1780. But in that year, there were but 68,270 alive on the island. At this rate of decrease, the population would have diminished to one half in 23 years. But to obtain general results, we must look to more comprehensive estimates than these. Unfortunately, there are to be found no full statistical details which might enable us to calculate, with accuracy, the number of Negroes and their descendants of mixed blood now on the Western Hemisphere. We know that there were, in 1860, 4,435,709 in the United States. We know that in the West Indies, including Guiana, there were 
they were emancipated by England, France, Denmark, Sweden, and Holland, about 915,000 slaves. And the usual estimate is that to these should be added one-fifth to obtain the present colored population of these colonies. This would give 1,098,000, or say in round numbers 1,100,000, as the entire colored population of the West Indian colonies of England, France, Holland, Denmark, and Sweden, let us say in 1860. The census returns of the Spanish West Indian colonies still slave are imperfect, and the several estimates of population in these islands vary widely. The most authentic estimates, based on actual census returns, make the slave and free colored population of Cuba, as late as 1853, a little more than half a million. With a fair allowance for increase since that date, we may put it in 1860 at 530,000. Puerto Rico, a flourishing and increasing colony, contained by a census return of 1846, 447,914 inhabitants of whom about 54% were white, leaving about 206,000 colored. The rate of increase for the 16 years preceding was a little upwards of 2% a year. As but 50 or 55,000 of the colored people in this island are slaves, so that the gradual falling off of the slave trade would not very seriously affect the population, we may suppose that some 25%, say 51,500, have been added since, making in all 257,500 for the entire colored population of Puerto Rico. This would give in the Spanish West Indian colonies a colored population in 1860 of 787,500. I have not been able to find any official returns of the populations of Haiti later than 1826. In 1820, in a memoir sur Saint Dominique by Lieutenant General Baron Pamphile de la Croix, the population of the island is put at 501,000, of whom only 1,000 are set down as white. In 1825, Monsieur Placida Justin estimated the population at 700,000. But in 1826, Charles Mackenzie, British Consul General in Haiti, obtained an official population return, not published, which had recently been made to the Haitian Chamber of Commerce. It gives the population of each commune separately, making the total population of the island at that time 423,042. This return Mr. Mackenzie considers more reliable than any other. It affords proof how little trustworthy are vague estimates of population, which usually overrun the truth, in consequence, probably, of the desire of a nation or its government, in the absence of an undeniable census, to represent its numerical strength as great as possible. Some of the very partial returns of an authentic character, furnished by Mackenzie, give the rate of natural increase in the population in certain communes at about three-quarters of one percent only per annum but no trustworthy deductions can be made from returns so limited. The actual rate of increase from 1836 to 1860, 34 years, is probably double, that is to say, 1.5% a year. Allowing for omissions and for Mackenzie's opinion that the census given, though the most reliable document he could obtain, may be an underestimate, let us instead of the total of 423,042 there given as the population in 1826, assume the black and colored population of Haiti in 1826 at Baron de la Croix's estimate of 500,000, adding thereto to bring it up to 1860 1.5% a year for 34 years, that is 51%, and we have the total Negro and mulatto population of the island at 755,000. As respects Central and South America, any estimate of the number of Negroes and their descendants of mixed blood must be found on data still uncertain than those which relate to the West Indies. Not only are we without any census of modern date to aid in the research, but an element of uncertainty intervenes which even census returns would fail to dispel. The aboriginal Indian races and their descendants of mixed blood 
are in large proportion all over this country and are so blended in some portions of it that it is impossible to distinguish between them and the african mulatto of various shades brazil the only considerable portion of the south american continent in which slavery exists contains of course by far the larger number of negroes probably four-fifths or more of all that are to be found in central or south america into this country slaves were imported from africa in considerable numbers as late as fifteen years ago a census spoken of as official bearing date june twenty second eighteen thirty one states the entire population at five millions thirty five thousand of which two millions are set down as slaves the free colored population is not given an estimate in the penny cyclopedia puts the negro population in eighteen thirty six at two millions namely sixteen hundred thousand slaves and four hundred thousand free if the proportion here given between slave and free be correct and if the census of eighteen thirty one may be trusted the number of free colored of african descent was then five hundred thousand this would make the entire colored population of african descent in eighteen thirty one two millions five hundred thousand that is about one half of the whole population the other half being whites indians and a mixed race sharing the indian blood from the year eighteen thirty one to the year eighteen fifty six we find no record of any population returns claiming to be official. In 1856, the Brazilian government published returns, summing up 7,678,000, but not distinguishing the races. The latest and probably most reliable authority on this subject is the work of Kidder and Fletcher on Brazil, from which, page 612, the above returns are taken these gentlemen believe the government returns of eighteen fifty six to be an overestimate and they give as more trustworthy a table made up from the estimates of sir francisco nunez de souza a native statistician quoted also by eubank the table was published in the agriculture brasileiro it is for eighteen fifty six and sums up seven millions and forty thousand the same authors give us also estimates of the percentage of slaves to the free population in one half of the provinces composing the empire it is to be regretted that the proportion in the other half the most populous containing more than three-fifths of the population cannot be obtained these estimates we are told are from the very careful computations of the hon j u pettit formerly united states consul at Miranum. They show an aggregate of 944,623 slaves in a population of 2,680,000. The number of free colored is not given. To bring these estimates up to 1860, we must add the increase of population during four years. The rate of increase, deduced from the average of estimates going back 30 years, is about 1 and 3 quarters percent a year, or 7 percent in four years this gives us four hundred and ninety two thousand eight hundred which added to seven millions forty thousand raises the total population of brazil in eighteen sixty to seven millions five hundred and thirty two thousand eight hundred an estimate which in default of an official census we adopt it is somewhat above the average of the current estimates of the day if the proportion of slaves to free persons be the same in the remaining ten provinces as in those estimated then the total number of slaves in the empire of brazil was in the year eighteen sixty two millions six hundred and fifty five thousand but inasmuch as the largest proportions of slaves to free persons are to be found in the populous provinces of the atlantic coast and as three of these to wit Pernambuco, Bahia, and Minas Gerais, each with a population of 800,000 or upwards, are among the provinces not estimated. We think the above total of 2,655,000 slaves is probably somewhat low, and that it may bear an addition of 10%. This would give for the Empire of Brazil in 1860 two millions nine hundred and twenty thousand five hundred slaves an estimate which we believe to be as near the truth as anything we are likely to obtain
I find no reliable data in regard to the number of free persons of African descent, of which the probable reason is the great mixture of colored races. The aborigines of Brazil at the period of its conquest are said to have numbered between four and five millions, and though probably not more than a fifth of that number now survive, the half and quarter breeds are very numerous. Eubank gives an estimate by the Senor de Souza, the same writer probably whose calculations of a later date is relied on by Kidder and Fletcher, in which, putting the total at about the same I have given, he divides the population into two millions one hundred and sixty thousand whites, three millions one hundred and twenty thousand negro slaves, eight hundred thousand domesticated Indians, one hundred and eighty thousand free blacks, and one million one hundred thousand free colored. Unless all the Indian half and quarter breeds are included in the class of domesticated Indians, which is not likely, we cannot regard the free colored as all of African blood. On the other hand, it is certain that the number of free Negroes and mulattoes in Brazil is large, larger perhaps than in any other slave country. By the Brazilian laws, a slave can go before a magistrate, have his price fixed, and can purchase himself. Large numbers avail themselves of this privilege, and the class of freemen is rapidly increasing. All writers agree that more than half the population of Brazil consists of persons of African descent, slave, and free. Under these circumstances, as it is my object not to overstate the case, and therefore to avoid all underestimates of the number of Negroes who may have survived the horrors of the Middle Passages and the cruelties of slavery, I assume de Souza's figures, without any deduction for Indian blood, making the free Negro population of all shades 1,280,000. This, added to the slaves, gives us as the population, free and slave, of African descent in the Empire of Brazil for the year 1860, a total of 4,200,500, leaving less than three millions and a third for whites, Indians, and Indian mixed races. One item still remains, the most vague and uncertain of any, the number of Negroes and mulattoes in the free republics of Central and South America. In all of these, the aboriginal races and their descendants vastly predominate. In all of them, the mixture of race and gradations of color defy analysis. In none of them has slavery had more than a comparatively ephemeral existence. But as Negroes do not voluntarily emigrate to the Western Hemisphere, all the Negroes or mulattoes to be found in these countries must be originally due to the slave trade, with such trifling additions as the straying off of slaves or of free colored persons from the West Indies or from Brazil may occasionally have made. In Mexico, the number of Negroes seems to be accurately ascertained. The various estimates differ, but a few hundreds, none under 6,000 and none over 7,000. Let us assume the latter number as the Negro population of Mexico in 1860. In Central America, as in Mexico, the representatives of the African race are a very insignificant part of the population. Squire, formerly charged the affairs of the United States to the republics of Central America, is undoubtedly one of the best, if not the very best, authority on the point. He says the population of Central America, in the absence of reliable data, can be calculated only approximately. The following table probably exhibits very nearly the exact proportions in Central America, so far as they may be deduced from existing data and from personal observation. Whites, 100,000. Indians, 1,109,000. Mixed races, 800,000. Negroes. 10,000. Total, 2,019,000. This would give us, for Mexico and Central America, 17,000. Let us say in round numbers, 20,000. If we pass to South America, we find in Venezuela a country coterminous with the slave colonies of Guyana, a considerable number of Negroes. Bonnie Castle estimated in 1818 that there were 54,000 Negroes in Venezuela. Codazzi puts down, in 1841, 
49,782 slaves. Negroes were employed in the wars of this republic, and in these many are said to have perished. It is certain that they have not increased in late years. Bonnycastle's calculation for 1818 is probably a full estimate for 1860. But we have just put the number at 60,000. New Grenada appears to contain a larger number of Negroes than any other of the South American Republic. Cobb, in his Historical Sketches of Slavery, puts the total in 1853 at 80,000. Bollert, apparently one of the most reliable authorities, so far as his researches extend, estimates that in 1860 there were of Ethiopian race in New Grenada 80,000. Colton, in his descriptive atlas, 1860, apparently following these authorities, puts the population at 2,243,054, of whom 80,000 were Negroes. I shall assume that to be the number. In Ecuador, the number is small. Belair sets it down for the year 1860 at 7,831, and Colton has the same estimate. In Peru, the largest proportions of Negroes is to be found in the province of Lima. Hill estimates for the province 7,500. Dr. Von Schudi puts the slaves in 1847 in the same province, at 4,792. Belaird estimates the total Negroes in Peru at 40,000. I cannot find, after much search, any estimate that seems more reliable than this last. In Chile, there have never been more than a few Negroes, either free or slave. The usual remark of the traveler, as Cobb, Schmidtmeyer, and Molina and others, is that very few Negroes are to be found there. Bollert puts the number as 31 only, but this must be an error, for in 1825 slavery was abolished, without difficulty or disturbance, it is true, which would indicate that the number was small. But it is not likely that so small a number as Bollert's estimate indicates would be made the subject of legislation at all. I have put down for Chile 1,000, which will probably cover all that are to be found there at this time. In Bolivia, in a population chiefly Indian, amounting to about two millions, we have no estimate whatever. Few pure Africans, says Colton. Some few Africans, says Bollert probably 3,000 may cover the total amount. In the Argentine Confederation previous to the revolution of July 9, 1816, slavery prevailed, and many slaves had been imported, some directly to Buenos Aires, others through Brazil. At the present time, the Negroes in La Plata are not numerous. There are a good many in Mendoza. The great mass of the population, however, are Indians, if we put the total number of Negroes within the Confederation at 25,000, we shall probably be above rather than below the truth. In Paraguay, there are few Negroes to be found. 5,000 will, I believe, cover the amount. They are more numerous in Uruguay. To this republic, previous to 1842, about which time slavery was abolished, there had been brought Negroes both directly from Africa and also through southern Brazil. One writer estimates the number of Negroes in Uruguay at 20,000, and as I find in the various works on this country no other estimate, I adopt this. In Patagonia it would appear from the various authorities that no Negroes are to be found. Thus we have for Mexico, Central America, and South America, apart from Brazil, the following estimate. Mexico and Central America, 20,000. Venezuela, 60,000. New Grenada, 80,000. Ecuador, 7,831. Peru, 40,000. Chile, 1,000. Bolivia, 5,000. Argentine Confederation, 25,000. Paraguay, 5,000. Uruguay, 20,000. Total, 263,831. Bringing together these various results, we find an approximating estimate of the number of Negroes and their descendants on the Western continent in the following table. 
Year 1860, in the United States, 4,435,709. In the English, French, Dutch, Danish, and Swedish West Indies, including Guyana, 1,100,000. In the Spanish West Indies, 787,500. In the island of Haiti, 755,000. In the empire of Brazil, 4,200,500. In the rest of South America and in Central America, 263,831. In Canada, 20,000. Total, 11,562,540. This total somewhat exceeds 11 millions and a half, but seeing that after diligent search I have been compelled to make up these estimates, especially for South America, from scanty materials, and desiring to put forth no argument founded on exaggerated data, and therefore not to underestimate the remnant remaining alive as descendants and representatives of the Negroes that brought to America from Africa, I add a quarter of a million to the sum of my estimate and will assume the number of Negroes and their descendants in the Western Hemisphere in 1860 to have been 11,812,540 souls. This is, beyond question, not an underestimate of the actual number left. What is the conclusion, then, at which we are forced to arrive? The fifteen millions and a half of poor wretches who were sentenced by the slave trade to transportation and slavery in foreign lands are now, after three centuries of servitude, represented in these lands by less than four-fifths of their original number. When we consider the tendency to natural increase in human beings, which has gradually swelled the population of the world to its eight hundred or a thousand millions, the above statement, as it stands, must be confessed to embody a terrible condemnation of that system, which as to a population half as large of the United States, not only arrested for eight or ten generations of men the operation of one of the great laws of the world, but without the life destruction of war, without the deadly agencies of pestilence or famine, not as we sometimes express it by the visitation of God, but by the sole operation of man's crime and misery thence resulting, produced a retrogression of numbers at a ratio which had it spread over the habitable earth would have extinguished in a few centuries all human existence. But the matter has been very imperfectly presented yet. The actual results were far more fatal than the simple statement we have given serfs to indicate. To obtain an accurate and intelligible view of these results, we must separate the fifteen millions and a half of expatriated Africans into two portions and trace out the separate destiny of each. End of chapter 7 Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com Part 1 Chapter 8 Of the Wrong of Slavery, the Right of Emancipation, and the Future of the African Race in the United States, by Robert Dale Owen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. The Wrong of Slavery, the Right of Emancipation, and the Future of the African Race in the United States, by Robert Dale Owen. Part 1 Chapter 8. Strangely Contrasting Fate of the Two Diverging Streams More than a third of the present representatives of these fifteen millions and a half inhabit, it will be observed, the United States. Less than two-thirds are scattered over the West Indies, Central and South America. But what proportion, let us inquire, of the Negroes shipped and slavers from Africa were the progenitors of the present colored population of the United States? and what proportion went to the West Indies and to Southern America. Here, as in previous calculations, though the materials be insufficient for absolute accuracy, we can approximate the truth. In the report of the Lords of Council, so often already referred to, there is but one table bearing on the subject. Footnote, Lords of Council Report, Part 4, Table Number 4. 
It exhibits the exportation of Negroes from the West Indies, then the principal place of their deposit and sale, for five years, namely, that from 1783 to 1787, both inclusive, showing that in these five years, out of 20,773 Negroes exported to all parts, 1,392 went to the States of America. That is, only about one-fifteenth of the whole, or 278 annually. Since so small a proportion out of the whole export was directed to the United States, it is evident that the demand for slaves at that time could not have been great. Nor do we find, throughout the report, any allusion to a direct trade by slavers from the African coast to the continental colonies. Of course it existed, but evidently not to a large extent. The public opinion, as well as the legislation of the colonies, had uniformly been against it. Footnote, the agency of the British government in fastening slavery upon the continental colonies is well known. Bancroft has placed it distinctly on record. Quote, the inhabitants of Virginia were controlled by the central authority on a subject of vital importance to themselves and their posterity. Their halls of legislation had resounded with eloquence, directed against the terrible plague of Negro slavery. Again and again, they had passed laws restraining the importation of Negroes from Africa, but their laws were disallowed. How to prevent them from protecting themselves against the increase of the overwhelming evil was debated by the king and council, and on the 10th day of December, 1770, he issued an instruction, under his own hand, commanding the governor, under pain of the highest displeasure, to assent to no law by which the importation of slaves should be, in any respect, prohibited or obstructed. In April, 1772, this rigorous order was solemnly debated in the Assembly of Virginia. They were very anxious for an act to restrain the importation of people, the number of whom already in the colony, gave them just cause to apprehend the most dangerous consequences. Virginia resolved to address the king himself, who in council had cruelly compelled the toleration of the nefarious traffic. They pleaded with him for leave to protect themselves against the nefarious traffic, and these were the words. The importation of slaves into the colonies from the coast of Africa hath long been considered as a trade of great inhumanity, and, under its present encouragement, we have too much reason to fear, will endanger the very existence of your majesty's American dominions. We are sensible that some of your majesty's subjects in Great Britain may reap emoluments from this sort of traffic. But when we consider that it greatly retards the settlement of the colonies, with more useful inhabitants, and may, in time, have the most destructive influence, we presume to hope that the interest of a few will be disregarded when placed in competition with the security and happiness of such numbers of your majesty's dutiful and loyal subjects. Deeply impressed with these sentiments, we most humbly beseech your majesty to remove all these restraints on your majesty's governors of this colony, which inhibit their assenting to such laws as might check so very pernicious a commerce. In this manner Virginia led the host, who alike condemned slavery and opposed the slave trade. Thousands in Maryland and in New Jersey were ready to adopt a similar petition. So were the legislatures of North Carolina, of Pennsylvania, of New York. Massachusetts, in its towns and in its legislature, unceasingly combated the condition, as well as the sale of slaves. There was no jealousy among one another in the strife against the crying evil, Virginia harmonized all opinions, and represented the moral sentiment and policy of them all. When her prayer reached England, Franklin, through the press, called to it the sympathy of the people. Again and again, it was pressed upon the attention of the ministers. But the government of that day was less liberal than the tribunals, and while a question respecting a Negro from Virginia led the courts of law to an axiom that as soon as any slave sets his foot on English ground he becomes free, the King of England stood in the path of humanity and made himself the pillar of the slave trade. Wherever in the colonies a disposition was shown for its restraint, his servants were peremptorily ordered to maintain it without abatement. Bancroft's History of the United States, Volume 4, page 413, 414, and 415. In the entire history of Great Britain, there is scarcely a more disgraceful page. End footnote. The English continental colonies, says Bancroft, were, in the aggregate, 
always opposed to the African slave trade. Maryland, Virginia, even Carolina, alarmed at the excessive production and consequent low price of their staples, at the heavy debts incurred by the purchase of slaves on credit, and at the dangerous increase of the colored population, each showed an anxious preference for the introduction of white men. And laws designed to restrict importations of slaves are scattered copiously among the records of colonial legislation. The first Continental Congress which took to itself powers of legislation gave a legal expression to the well-formed opinion of the country by resolving on April 6, 1776, that no slaves be imported into any of the thirteen United Colonies. Footnote. Bancroft's United States, Volume 3, page 411. As to the number of slaves actually imported during colonial days, the same historian says, It is not easy to conjecture how many Negroes were imported into the English colonial colonies. The usual estimates far exceed the truth. Climate came in aid of opinion to oppose the introduction of them. From the first, they appear to have increased, though owing to the inequality of the sexes, not rapidly in the first generation. Previous to the year 1740, there may have been introduced into our country nearly 130,000. Before 1776, a few more than 300,000. Footnote. Bancroft's United States. Volume 3, page 407. The Duc de Rochefoucault Leoncourt, who traveled into the United States in 1795, says, Nearly twenty vessels from the harbors of the United States are employed in the importation of Negroes to Georgia and to the West India Isles. The Duke designates the merchants of Rhode Island as the conductors of what he calls the accursed traffic, which they are determined to persevere in till the year 1808, the period fixed by the Constitution when it is permitted to abolish it. But, he observes, they ship only one Negro for every ton of the burden of their vessels, which, moreover, he adds, are small ones. Footnote. Travels by the Duc de Rochefoucault Leoncourt, Volume 2, page 292, of the English translation. The tables given in the Lords of Council's report show that a considerable portion of the slavers in those days were but of a hundred tons burden. This was probably the capacity of the Rhode Island slavers. If so, the number of slaves annually carried by each was one hundred only, making, in all, an annual importation by them of two thousand slaves. But a portion of these went to the West Indies, another proof, it may be remarked, that the demand at home was not great. On the other hand, slaves may have been imported in English bottoms, some were in Dutch, and it is true, as already stated, that a few hundred slaves were annually brought from the West Indies. Upon the whole, it seems a high estimate to put the annual importation for some years after the close of the Revolutionary War at 3,000. During that war, as commercial intercourse with foreign nations was almost wholly suspended, few or no slaves could have been imported. And the trade was probably resumed but gradually after the war. From 1776 to 1790, there were only six years when the trade could be considered open. If we estimate that 2,500 were imported, during each of these six years, we have 15,000 as the importation from 1776 to 1790. Let us suppose Bancroft's, a few more than 300,000, to mean 310,000, and we have the total number of slaves imported into the United States up to the year 1790 as follows. Up to the year 1776, 310,000. From the year 1776 to the year 1790, 15,000. Total imported up to 1790, 325,000. At this point we emerge, in a measure, into light. The census commences. We know that the colored population of the United States in 1790 was 757,363, of whom 59,466 were free. The 325,000 that had been imported were, in that year, represented by 757,363. The colored population of the United States had already considerably more than doubled itself by natural increase. At the end of the next decade, that is to say, in the year 1800, this population was 
1,436, having increased in 10 years at the rate of about 32 and a quarter percent. How much of this accession was due to natural increase, and how much was slave trade importation? The rate of increase among the colored population of the United States has been, by the census, as follows. In the decade from 1790 to 1800, 32.23 percent. From 1800 to 1810, 37.58 percent. Here the slave trade ceases. In the decade from 1810 to 1820, 28.58 percent. From 1820 to 1830, 31.44 percent. From 1830 to 1840, 23.41 percent. From 1840 to 1850, 26.62%. From 1840 to 1850, 26.62%. From 1850 to 1860, 21.9%. During the first decade, in which there was no disturbing element by importation of slaves, to wit, from 1810 to 1820, the rate of increase was 28.58. During the next decade, 31.44. Let us assume the former as the rate of natural increase from 1790 to 1800. Deducting it from the actual increase during that period, namely, 32.23%, we have a remainder of 3 and 2 thirds percent as the increase from Africa. That would give 27,770 as the number of slaves imported in the 10 years from 1790 to 1800, or at the rate of 2,777 a year. In the next decade, eight years of which only were open to slave importation, that importation appears to have greatly increased. The colored population amounted, by the census of 1810, to 1,373,810, exhibiting an increase in the decade at the rate of 37.58%. If, as before, we rate the natural increase at 28.58%, we shall have 9% on 1,000,436, 1, that is to say, 9,123, of accession to the population in question, due to other causes than natural increase. But during this decade, to wit, in 1803, Louisiana, purchased from France, became a part of the Union, and her colored population, free and slave, added 42,245 to the census returns of 1810. Deduct this amount from 90,123, and we have 47,884 as the number of slaves that may have been directly imported into the United States in the eight years from 1800 to 1808, being at the rate of 5,985 a year. The rate of importation was evidently increasing with rapidity. Fortunate was it for our country and for the cause of humanity that Congress availed itself of the constitutional provision which permitted, in 1808, the abolition of the slave trade. Another item remains to be determined, ere we can complete our estimate of importation. Of the colored population which Louisiana brought into the Union, what proportion may we properly ascribe to the slave trade, and what proportion to natural increase? The total number at the date of purchase appears to have been about 30,000. Footnote. By an accurate census of Louisiana, taken in 1785, the total population was 28,537, of whom about 14,000 were slaves and 1,000 free colored. From that date, there seems to have been no separate authentic census of the colony, until one was made in 1803 by the Consul of the United States at New Orleans, under orders from the Department of State. From the best documents he could obtain, he put the total population at 49,473, but without separating whites and blacks. See History of Louisiana from the Earliest Period, by Francois-Xavier Martin, New Orleans, 1827, Volume 2, pages 77 and 78. Other authorities put it higher, as Major Amos Stoddard, in his Sketches Historical and Descriptive of Louisiana, page 226. He admits that there are no precise data to determine the population in 1803, but estimates 50,700 whites and 42,600 colored, together upwards of 93,000. This, however, 
is clearly an overestimate, as our own official census of 1810 makes the entire population of Louisiana in that year but 76,556. At first sight, the consul's estimates of 49,473 seems too low, since, if it be not, 50%, was added to the populations in the seven years from 1803 to 1810. This would seem improbable, but for the remarkable fact that the entire population of Louisiana, chiefly of course, by immigration from other states of the Union and from Europe, doubled in the next decade, amounting in 1820 to 152,923. As a medium term between these conflicting authorities, we may assume the entire population in 1803 to be 60,000, of whom half were colored. This agrees with Mr. Carey's estimate. Speaking of the colored population, Mr. Carey says, nearly 30,000 were found in Louisiana at her incorporation into the Union. The slave trade, domestic and foreign, page 17. End footnote. To supply this number, how many had probably been imported under colonial rule? Except as to difference of nationality in her owners, Louisiana, previous to 1808, was not differently situated from the southern states of the Union. Part of the same continent, coterminous in her chief boundaries, with similar climate and general condition, there seems no good reason to suppose that the natural increase of her colored population had been at a rate much lower than ours. But in 1808, our colored population had very nearly trebled its original numbers. Let us suppose, to avoid the chance of overestimate, that in 1803 the slaves and free-colored people of Louisiana had only doubled in number as compared to their African descendants. That would give 15,000 as the number imported into that colony up to the time when it became part of the United States. Footnote. I ought here, in strictness, to add that proportion of the slave and free-colored population of Texas at the time of her admission which may be supposed to have been due to the African slave trade. But in the first place, it was small, a very small proportion of the total. It was about 58,518 five years after annexation, being undoubtedly due to natural increase. Secondly, we cannot tell how many slaves may have been taken thither from the United States. And lastly, it is more than offset by the fugitive colored population of Canada, and the colonized population of Liberia, neither of which enter into the United States Census, although both go to increase the total, to which the half million slaves shipped in Africa for the United States had actually swelled in 1860. End footnote. Summing up these various items, we have the total number of slaves imported into the United States, up to the date of the abolition of the slave trade, as follows. Up to 1790, as before. 325,000. From 1790 to 1800, 27,770. From 1800 to 1810, 47,884. Imported into Louisiana, previous to her purchase from France, 15,000. Total slaves imported into the United States, 415,654. Footnote. An industrious and painstaking author, accustomed to statistics, makes the total one-fifth less than this. Mr. Henry Charles Carey, in his Slavery, Domestic and Foreign, Philadelphia, 1853, page 18, after furnishing his reasons for each separate estimate, sums up as follows. Prior to 1714, 30,000. From 1715 to 1750, 90,000. From 1751, to 1760, 35,000. From 1761 to 1770, 74,500. From 1771 to 1790, 34,000. Subsequent to 1790, 70,000. Total number imported up to 1808, 333,500. I think Mr. Carey has estimated the rate of natural increase in early days, say from 1714 to 1770, too high, not allowing for the effect, then sensibly felt, of that disproportion between the sexes incident to the slave trade, to which we shall hereafter have occasion to advert. End footnote. 
It is to be observed that this is an estimate, not of the slaves that were exported from Africa, destined to the United States, but of those that were actually landed there. If the loss on the voyage was, as we have estimated, 20 percent, footnote, see page 59, the above 415,654 Negroes represent about 525,000 shipped on the African coast, whether directly for this country or by coming way of the West Indies. Since 525,000 less 20 percent is 416,000. If the statement of the Duc de Rochefoucault, footnote, see page 87, that the Rhode Island slavers carried but one Negro, for each ton burden may be relied on, the average mortality on board slave ships bound to North America was likely to have been less than 20 percent. It would probably be safe to estimate that out of half a million Negroes shipped from Africa, the number above estimated to have reached us may have been landed. Referring now to our estimate of the number of slaves taken from the African coast during the three centuries and a half of the slave trade, namely, 15,525,000, we may assert, in round numbers, that half a million of these went to our own country, chiefly during its colonial existence, and 15 millions to the West Indies and to South and Central America. We now have the means of answering the following questions. What became of each of these two so unequal divisions of this expatriated people? What has been the respective destiny of each? How are they now represented? The answer involves results so extraordinary, at first sight so incredible, and, in effect, even when thoroughly examined, so difficult of satisfactory explanation, that I have devoted much time and labor to the critical revision of the materials, whence my conclusions are drawn, before venturing to place them on record. This is the answer. The half million shipped for North America have increased nearly ninefold, being represented in 1860 by a population exceeding 4,400,000, while the 15 million sent to the West Indian colonies and to Southern America have diminished, from age to age, until they are represented now by less than half their original number. Footnote. Those who may be tempted to object to this latter calculation, as based in part on approximating estimates, would do well to hear in mind that it is fully borne out by another calculation, already given, pages 63, 64, etc., and which is based upon official tables alone. A calculation covering a period of 74 years in the last century, and extending to the entire Negro population of the largest English West Indian colony, Jamaica, throughout these 74 years, the results in condensed view being as follows. Negroes in Jamaica in 1702, 41,596. Negroes imported from 1702 to 1775, 497,736. Deduct exported from 1702 to 1775, 137,014. Leaving in the island imported slaves, 360,722. Total in 1775, if population had been stationary, 402,318. But the actual population in 1775 was 192,787. Showing a reduction, in three quarters of a century, in the Negro population of Jamaica, of more than one half. End footnote. How marvelous, beyond all human preconception, are these results. Had the fifteen millions whose lot was cast in the southern portion of our hemisphere increased in the same proportion as the half million who were carried into its northern continent, their descendants, instead of dwindling to half, would have been today a multitude numbering more than a hundred and thirty millions of men. End of Part 1, Chapter 8